Dr. Ioannidis, when we spoke to you on March 23rd, you said we needed more data before we could ascertain what was happening. Since then, you've been busily gathering that data and have published three studies. Let's start with the latest one, which you entitle COVID-19 Antibody Seroprevalence in Santa Clara County, California. What was the purpose of that study and what did you discover? This study aimed to generate uh, an estimate of uh, how many people in Santa Clara County have been infected with the virus. And the way to find out is to try to see whether they have developed antibodies uh, to SARS-CoV-2. So we had a sample of residents in Santa Clara County uh, evaluated for the presence of uh, antibodies. And uh, the sample was uh, 3,300 uh, people uh, who came to be tested. We estimated that based on what we saw, between uh, 2.5 and 4.2 percent of the population of uh, the county has antibodies, which is uh, an indication that uh, they have been infected uh, with the virus uh, uh, a while ago. What are your conclusions based on your study? Uh, if you compare the numbers that we estimate uh, to have been infected, uh, which uh, vary from 48,000 to 81,000 versus uh, the number of documented cases uh, that would correspond to the same time horizon around April 1st uh, when we had 956 uh, cases documented uh, in Santa Clara County, we realize that uh, the number of infected people is somewhere between 50 and 85 times more compared to what we thought, compared to what uh, had been documented. Immediately, that means that the infection fatality rate, uh, the chance of uh, dying, the probability of dying if uh, you are infected, diminishes by 50 to 85 fold because the denominator in the calculation becomes 50 to 85 fold bigger. If you take these numbers into account, they suggest that uh, the infection fatality rate for this new coronavirus is likely to be in the same ballpark as seasonal influenza. Of course, uh, there is still a little bit of uncertainty about the exact number, but uh, it's clearly very different compared to the original thoughts or speculations or preliminary data that suggested a much, much higher infection fatality rate. Could you imagine um, any way to ascertain the deaths that will be caused by this lockdown in deaths of despair, suicide, the, the after effects from loss of work. Is there even an epidemiological way to count the devastation that has been wrought by the lockdown? I think that the devastation can be uh, extreme and it can be far worse than anything that coronavirus can do. I have to qualify that statement uh, with the fact that uh, we have never seen that before. So we have to extrapolate from knowledge from previous economic crises and economic meltdowns that were nevertheless different. We've, we've never seen such an acute meltdown. We've never seen such a, a set of uh, perfect storm circumstances. In some ways, it could mean also that uh, maybe we could be a bit more optimistic. For example, if this thing goes away for one reason or another, let's say seasonality or suddenly the virus disappears, of course, that's a very optimistic scenario. And then everybody just forgets about it and goes back to work and just do whatever they used to do. One might argue that the damage will not be that severe. However, as you realize, this is not uh, a scenario that is uh, so easy to imagine, uh, even if uh, all the data tend to be optimistic, even if the cases start going down, the entire society has gone through a stage of shock. Uh, it's very difficult to convince people to start doing again what they used to do. They will have fear, justifiably so. Uh, they will avoid lots of things, and it will take some time to get back to normalcy, even if the virus kind of, quote-unquote, disappears. There are data from previous economic crises that can give us some hint about the magnitude of the impact. For example, we know that suicides go up by 1% for each 1% increase in unemployment. And as you know, uh, as of now, we are talking about uh, 25 million uh, people filing for unemployment in this country, uh, 
and uh, probably almost 10 times that many uh, around the world becoming unemployed, and the number is, is rapidly increasing as we speak. We know that there's huge problems with uh, other problems of uh, common diseases like uh, cancer and uh, heart attacks. Uh, they can go up, uh, or actually the trajectories of decrease that we have seen for many of these conditions are reversed, and they're not decreasing at the same slope or actually even increase in situations of meltdown. Less people will die because of uh, car accidents, uh, but is that really a benefit to be proud of? And uh, then there's other problems. There's uh, all that meltdown of mental health. There's uh, child abuse. There's domestic violence. We already see hints that these problems are escalating. Violence in general. We see that uh, gun sales are escalating, and I do really worry about uh, people who are locked down and desperate and uh, losing their jobs and, and uh, just feeling completely lost in, in a world that they cannot understand uh, how it is evolving and, and why. It's very, very difficult to, to fathom the, the consequences of, uh, of what is going on and what we're doing. But uh, I really worry that unless we manage to have a viable plan to exit from lockdown and shelter in place and reopen our world, the consequences will be far worse than coronavirus. Our data suggests that uh, uh, COVID-19 has an infection fatality rate that is in the same ballpark as seasonal influenza. It suggests that uh, even though this is a very serious problem, we should not fear. It suggests that uh, we have solid ground to have optimism about the possibility of eventually reopening our society and gaining back our lives. Sooner rather than later, I hope. Sooner rather than later with full control and a data-driven approach. I believe it's your most recent study it talks about nosocomial infection. Could you tell us what that is and, and how it could be uh, avoided? Nosocomial infection uh, is uh, infection that happens in the hospital. It's uh, probably one mechanism that has contributed to the substantial number of deaths uh, with uh, coronavirus with COVID-19 that we have seen in some epicenters of the pandemic, like uh, some cities in Italy, some cities in Spain, and uh, several locations in the U.S., prominently New York City and the New York uh, metropolitan area. If uh, you think that uh, uh, COVID-19 has pretty much the same uh, infection uh, fatality rate as, uh, let's say, seasonal influenza, one immediately would argue uh, well, do we really see this type of uh, disaster as we have seen in uh, these particular cities with, uh, with seasonal influenza? And the answer is that uh, even with seasonal influenza, we do see occasionally some um, uh, excess in specific locations. It's not that uh, all locations are evenly hit. We do see hospitals crash uh, occasionally, especially hospitals that tend to run close to uh, full capacity and have... Uh, high numbers of susceptible populations like elderly, like in the case of Italy, or disadvantaged populations like in the case of Queens or other locations in uh, New York City. We do see that, but we don't really see that uh, extreme concentration that uh, we have seen with uh, COVID-19. If, if you take uh, the U.S. data as of now, more than 50 percent of uh, U.S. deaths uh, have accumulated uh, in a very narrow strip of the country uh, New York uh, City, uh, Long Island, and, and New Jersey have the lion's share of deaths. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, Italy, the same thing. Three cities, three uh, regions uh, uh, which uh, don't really have a large population account for about a quarter of all the deaths that were documented there. The common mechanism seems to be that uh, uh, in all of these locations, uh, uh, we had massive uh, disasters because we don't have a vaccine for coronavirus. In contrast to influenza, where medical personnel can be vaccinated and therefore we don't get to see that much nosocomial influenza, influenza spreading within the hospital. For coronavirus, we don't have a vaccine. So hospitals that are very close to capacity, like Queens, for example, that tends to be a war zone even in summertime, if you get a very large number of people who come to the hospital with symptoms. They show up at the emergency room. They wait to be uh, seen uh, 
probably they start infecting each other, they can infect physicians, they can infect uh, nurses, they can infect personnel. Medical personnel then would infect other patients within the hospital. And the hospitals typically are the places where you find the most vulnerable people. You, you see elderly people, you see people with underlying diseases, you pe see people who are sick for other reasons. We have documented that both in Italy and in Spain, and probably the same has happened in uh, our country, in, in the United States, uh, places that saw these excess deaths had massive infections of medical personnel. In uh, Italy, we have seen that uh, uh, as of one week ago that I had the latest uh, uh, scrutinized data, we had 14,000 people who were medical personnel who had been infected. In the U.S., it seems that in some locations we also have very high rates because, as I said, there's no vaccine for uh, this coronavirus, much like there is for influenza. This means that uh, the, the battle moves in the most unsuitable battleground. Uh, hospitals are the worst place to, to fight the war with uh, COVID-19. We should have done our best to keep people away from the hospital if they had COVID-19 symptoms unless they really had very severe symptoms, and in which case, of course, they needed medical care. I think that in many of these places, unfortunately, we saw many people going to the hospital probably under a sense of, uh, of fear and threat and, and panic, and we, we had the environment heavily contaminated, generating hospital chains of infection and uh, therefore infecting lots of people who were very susceptible and would do very poorly if uh, on top of whatever they had, they also got COVID-19 infection. We should very, be very careful. Coronavirus is not influenza. It's a different virus. It has different propensity to spread, but it also has uh, the ability to infect elderly and debilitated people, frail people, people who have underlying diseases. And the best location for the virus to find its victims is the hospitals, both acute care and chronic care facilities, and nursing homes. And, and this is really where we get massive uh, infections and a, a very large number of deaths that goes beyond uh, what we have seen in the large majority of locations around the world. But in your recent study, I think there's a message to healthcare providers uh, in terms of the case fatality rate. Could you talk about that? For, uh, a major concern about uh, uh, healthcare providers is that uh, the early data that we had suggested that uh, SARS-CoV-2 has a very high infection fatality rate. Uh, you remember the early quote by the WHO of 3.4% of people who get infected will die. You remember the uh, estimates that were built in the early mathematical models by Imperial College suggesting that 1% or 0.9% of people who get infected will die and uh, also very high rates of uh, uh, hospitalization, even among those uh, who do not die. Uh, you can imagine what that means to our heroes who are fighting on the front line in hospitals, uh, physicians and nurses and staff, thinking that if they get infected, they have one out of 30 chances of, of dying. Based on what we see now, it seems that the infection fatality is much, much lower. And in fact, uh, the data from Italy, which are the more mature, suggest that uh, the infection fatality rate uh, is about 0.3% for infected personnel. If you take into account the fact that Italy has uh, the oldest or one of the oldest uh, uh, medical personnel workforce uh, in the world. And if you also account for the fact that uh, a very large number of personnel probably have not been tested and must have been infected because we see that the majority of infections tend to be asymptomatic or extremely mildly symptomatic. If you, you correct for these factors, you get to the same estimate that is very close to the infection fatality rate of influenza, also for medical personnel. This means that uh, probably we can offer some reassuring message to, to these heroes who, who fight uh, night and day under very dire circumstances. At least uh, we can tell them that uh, their risk of, of dying is not what was thought to be the case. We also need to give a very strong message that stringent infection control and uh, hygienic measures within the hospital environment, uh, both acute and chronic care facilities, is of paramount importance. Also, we need to give the message that uh, patients who think they may have symptoms of COVID-19 
they should not go to the hospital. That's not the place to go, really. Uh, patients with other problems, serious problems, are avoiding to go to the hospital, unfortunately, and these people should go to the hospital. But if, if someone has these mild or, or even moderate symptoms with COVID-19, they should not go to the hospital. I think we should also think about the need to detect infections in the hospital environment. So, for example, universal screening of medical personnel and uh, use of quarantine for people who are detected to be positive may also help to eliminate uh, this uh, infection that may be spreading in the hospital environment, especially in overcrowded and overwhelmed uh, lo locations. Okay, just moving quickly through some of the other studies that you have done. Uh, another study you published earlier this month is called uh, Population COVID-19 Mortality Risk for Non-Elderly Individuals Overall and for Non-Elderly Individuals Without Underlying Conditions in Pandemic Centers. What did you study in this case and what did you discover? This study was uh, an effort to put together the evolving uh, data sets from uh, several countries and several states uh, in the U.S. trying to understand uh, how much bigger is the risk uh, of uh, people who are less than 65 years old versus older individuals and also try to get some estimates of their absolute risk of, uh, of dying during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also tried to see uh, whether people who also did not have any, un any underlying conditions were likely to die. Uh, you have seen in the news multiple stories about young people with no health problems who uh, get severe outcomes and die, and uh, many such cases uh, are reverberating and obviously creating a sense of horror and panic. We wanted to see how frequent that is and uh, how big is the exact risk of uh, dying if you are at different age groups. The first major finding is that if you compare people who are less than 65 versus those who are above 65, there's a huge gradient of risk. The risk is about uh, 70 times larger in those who are above 65 or equivalently 70-fold lower in those who are less than 65 in uh, eight European countries that we analyzed. And the risk gradient is a bit smaller. It is about a 15-fold difference in the U.S., but still a very large difference. You can imagine what it means to have 15 times lower or, or higher risk of death. We also saw that um, uh, the proportion of people who are less than 65 uh, in terms of the overall pool of deaths accounted for anywhere between 5 and 9 percent of all deaths in European countries and a somewhat larger percentage ranging from uh, 20 to 30 percent in uh, some uh, states uh, in the United States that has, have started accumulating uh, some data as the pandemic is maturing. We also try to estimate uh, what is the absolute risk uh, if you're less than 65? And uh, we try to compare that against uh, the risk of dying if you drive your car over a given distance. In doing this, uh, we try to correct for the number of days that the pandemic is ongoing. So you can get an estimate per day. In many locations like Germany, the risk of dying from uh, coronavirus uh, until we, we did the analysis on April 4 is in the range of uh, the risk of dying driving from home to work or, or even less. In uh, US- if, 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 you're, uh, if you're under 65. If you're 65 or less, indeed. And with or without underlying conditions. With or without underlying conditions. In the US, uh, where we have a, a larger share of uh, people who are uh, a bit younger compared to the European countries, that risk is higher. But uh, still, it is not in the range that uh, uh, someone uh, should really be afraid of, of dying. It is in the range of uh, uh, driving, uh, you know, not from home to work. Uh, in the case of New York, of course, it's much higher. It's equivalent to the risk of a truck driver who has uh, long shifts every day uh, driving for, for many, many hours. But still, this is something that some people do for a living. So... I think that if you take that perspective and acknowledging for the fact that the epidemic is still evolving and uh, we cannot be sure whether we will hit uh, even higher peaks in the future, although this doesn't seem to be the case, at least for uh, 
the European countries, and it, it seems to be that even in the U.S., in most states, we're very close to the peak, if not past the peak. The risk is something that should be uh, manageable as opposed to the uh, panic and horror stories that are circulating about a, a risk that is amazing and uh, uh, co completely beyond imagination to deal with. There was another aspect to the, the study we're discussing now, which is that people under 65 or under without underlying conditions have what risk? You, you, it, was, it seemed that you were saying it was negligible. Could you speak about that? People who are less than 65 and, and have no underlying conditions is, is extremely, extremely tiny. Uh, these people account uh, for less than 1%, uh, actually in many countries in Europe, less than 0.5% of all deaths uh, that uh, we see. And uh, in the U.S., uh, data that we have from New York suggests that they're a little bit over 1%, but not much so. So for someone who's less than 65 and has no underlying diseases, the risk is completely negligible. I think that uh, we have to uh, see whether we get additional data uh, and uh, we have a more granular view of uh, uh, some people who uh, still do not have in-depth assessment of their medical records, but it, it seems that uh, these deaths are extremely exceptional, very unlikely. And, and in a place like New York, uh, it's slightly higher. And you said that's because we're a, there's a younger population? Or, I'm sorry, what, why is the risk higher in New York? In New York, the, the risk is substantially higher. And uh, this is why I use the analogy of uh, a truck driver who is driving uh, long shifts on a daily basis. We have to wait and see how the data from New York City mature, though, because they're really an outlier compared to any other place in the country and uh, even any other place in the world. Uh, we clearly have a very large number of, of deaths uh, in New York City. Uh, there is some contentious issue about what exactly should count as a COVID-19 death. For example, in uh, uh, the last uh, few days, we have seen a very large number of probable COVID-19 deaths being added to the figures. And uh, these are deaths where we have not documented uh, with laboratory testing the presence of the virus. So it, they're pretty presumptive in terms of uh, uh, whether these are deaths that were caused by COVID-19. COVID-19 was present, but not really uh, a key player in the demise of the patient. So I, I think we need to wait and see some mature data on uh, what exactly the contribution of the virus has been in different deaths that we have documented. In Italy, where we have some more mature data, we see that uh, close to 99% of uh, people have underlying diseases actually, in most cases, multiple underlying diseases and underlying causes that could also have led them to death. In the U.S., it seems to be less, but uh, we would need to get some more in-depth analysis of uh, what exactly is killing these people and how. Uh, I want to get back to the addition in New York City of 4,000 deaths and the CDC guidance to assume COVID-19, um, in particular deaths, uh, and many deaths, uh, but just if you could just outline for us, you published a piece in the Journal of the American Medical Association concerning Italy. Could you tell us what the gist of that was? So uh, the, the data in Italy suggests that uh, it's very difficult to differentiate between deaths uh, by uh, SARS-CoV-2 and deaths uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Since uh, we had uh, close to 99% of uh, people dying have other causes that may have contributed to their demise, it's very difficult to dissociate and say that these people specifically died because they were infected. It's very likely that many of them would have died anyhow, if not immediately within a very short period of time because of these other causes of death uh, that uh, they had. I think that this is an ongoing debate, and uh, I think that uh, we will need to sort that out not only for Italy, but for every other country. Countries use very different systems of recording uh, deaths, and uh, uh, we know 
uh, not just from the COVID-19 era, but also from the past, that uh, filling out death certificates can be very tricky. We know that death certificates uh, often are pretty inaccurate. And uh, if you create an environment where people believe that uh, uh, this is the cause of death that is uh, really the most prominent at the moment, they may subconsciously uh, or unconsciously prefer to list COVID-19 as a major cause of death in the certificate, even though it may be uh, a less uh, significant contributor, if not an, an innocent bystander in, in some cases. This is very difficult to tell at the moment because as you realize, the, the battle is still ongoing, but uh, at some point we need to go back and check very carefully and try to understand what exactly did the virus do to all these people. If we do that, we will be able also to estimate uh, how many years of life were really lost because uh, it's not just the number of uh, deaths, but it's the number of person years lost that matters the most. If, if you have someone who's young and healthy and has no other problem and suddenly dies in their 20s, this is a very large number of person years lost compared to someone who is uh, uh, very old and has multiple reasons to, to die and is, uh, is already dying from something else and you just happen to find a PCR positive test for SARS-CoV-2 in a nasal swab. Uh, the, the number of person years lost is, is very small and you're not even sure that uh, SARS-CoV-2 really did contribute to their death substantially. Just as an aside, now that you've mentioned the PCR test, um, we've seen recently that the inventor of the PCR test, who's now deceased, had said it should never be used for testing for infectious diseases. Are, are you aware that he said that? And what, what, what is your position on the PCR test as, as an accurate guide, since it you know, seems to find such small pieces of genetic material, and, as opposed to uh, uh, an antibody test, you know, what, what, what are the distinctions there? I think that all tests have uh, advantages and disadvantages. PCR was a major breakthrough for, for medical science. It, it did allow us to be able to detect uh, uh, different things, including infectious pathogens, uh, if they were present, their, if their genome was present in very, very small amounts. Uh, as you realize, that also creates a situation where you may be able to detect something that does not have clinical significance. Uh, it's you know, very, very uh, good at detecting things, but then you have to ask, uh, so does it really matter uh, for what I'm seeing in terms of the clinical course? In many cases, the picture is very clear cut. You, you have a clear syndrome of uh, respiratory failure on someone who had no problem and this thing has happened acutely, and uh, then you get a positive PCR and you don't see a positive test for other viruses or, or for other uh, causes, I, I think that this is a very clear picture. But in many others, uh, it becomes uh, far more fragile as a diagnosis. I think PCR is a great tool, provided that we know what it means and how it is interpreted. Another drawback is that uh, what we detect is fragments of virus, not necessarily infective virus. So it, it doesn't mean that someone who has a positive PCR is also infectious at the same time. That, that's a, something that uh, may not be the case. Antibodies is a, a different story. And antibodies uh, have been developed as a, a technique uh, for even longer uh, time compared to, to PCR. Uh, we have had the ability to measure antibodies for many, many decades now and uh, they give us an answer to a different question. They give us an answer to the question, do you have some evidence that you have mounted an immune response to the virus or to whatever else uh, you might have been infected? Problems with antibodies uh, include the fact that they need to be very carefully validated. So you need to have some very good uh, sense of uh, how sensitive they are, uh, meaning how many people who have been infected they are able to detect antibodies in, and how specific they are, uh, meaning uh, is it uh, possible that uh, someone may have a false positive test and uh, you believe that they have antibodies, but actually they do not. And uh, there are many reasons why that may happen if the antibody test is not uh, very carefully designed. Uh, 
it may pick some uh, cross-reactivity with some other viruses, for example, some old coronaviruses that were circulating in the past. This is why both PCR and even more antibody tests need to be very carefully validated. We need to check them against uh, samples that we know for sure that uh, correspond to people who have been infected. And we need to test them also very carefully against samples that we know for sure that uh, they do not have uh, SARS-CoV-2. For example, there are samples that were collected two or three years ago, and therefore SARS-CoV-2 would not have been around at that time. This is pretty much what we did in our study. We very carefully validated uh, the antibody test uh, that, uh, that we used, and I think that other antibody tests are also being validated pretty thoroughly. You need to take into account their performance, uh, what we call their sensitivity and specificity, in generating reliable estimates about what the results mean. What do you think about uh, what is currently being postulated that it's, it's possible that those with the antibodies may not be immune in future? It, what, what is your sense of that? I think this is very speculative, and uh, obviously it's a hypothesis that uh, we need to, to pursue. There's uh, two possibilities, actually, that lead to uh, different conclusions. Uh, one is that uh, you have antibodies, but these would not be enough to protect you from future infection. I think this is not very likely, uh, although it becomes likely if we're talking about protecting you from infection, let's say, uh, next year or two years or three years down the road, because it is possible that uh, this coronavirus uh, uh, will change itself uh, if it ever comes back. We just don't know when and if it comes back. It may be a different variant, and uh, much like we see with other viruses, and uh, much like we see even with influenza, and this is the reason why each year we try to prepare a new vaccine to cover the new types, it is possible that uh, the antibodies that we develop now uh, would not be able to cover this new variant, or that uh, the, the titers, the levels of the antibodies, will go down after a, a given time. Uh, unlikely that they would go down very quickly, but if we're talking about uh, a year or two years from now, who knows? It, it could be that uh, they're no longer in sufficiently high titers. When one has the measles, the wild measles naturally, one is given lifetime immunity, and yet when one gets the measles vaccine, one can become reinfected with the measles within 10 years or perhaps even less. Does that speak to whether or not we should be trying to immunize in a different way uh, from SARS-CoV-2 than, than with vaccination? It's pretty early to say, but I would like to give you also uh, an opposite perspective. Uh, so we talked about uh, the possibility that even though you have antibodies, you're not protected, which I think it's not likely, although in, in a time horizon it may become likely. There's the alternative possibility that uh, you do not have detected, detectable antibodies, uh, but nevertheless, uh, you have encountered the virus and you have generated some immune response and somehow you have cleared the virus and you're okay. And there's some preliminary data that suggests that, uh, particularly in young individuals, many of them, perhaps in some cases the majority, they do not develop uh, necessarily high enough antibody titers, but nevertheless they clear the virus and they have full recovery with absolutely no problem. What that might mean is that our ability to deal with SARS-CoV-2 may not necessarily depend just on antibodies. Our, our immune system is very complex. There's many mechanisms of uh, innate immunity, and uh, perhaps there's other ways that we can still handle the virus and uh, not be at risk uh, any longer. This is still something that we need to explore in more depth. We need to find out uh, what exactly we need to uh, be protected. Depending on what the answer is, the prospects of a vaccine may be more favorable or less favorable. For example, the classic vaccine typically wants to generate an antibody response and make sure that that response would last. As you realize, if uh, there's other mechanisms that are equally good or better, then this becomes less relevant. And also, if that antibody response only lasts for a short while after vaccination, then again, a vaccine that aims to do that becomes less relevant.
I'm very interested to hear you say that because, uh, of course, on the one hand, we have, uh, for instance, the Bill Gates Foundation, which is suggesting that they are going to produce 7 billion doses of vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and some within the uh, WHO, CDC, and the Gates Foundation seem to be suggesting that we won't make it out, of, that we oughtn't get out and into our normal lives until there is a vaccine. So you're saying the, the jury is, is out on that. I, I would like to be optimistic that we should be able to uh, regain much, much of our functional life uh, uh, before a vaccine becomes available, if ever a vaccine becomes available, because uh, as we discussed, there's uh, all these caveats about the ability to get a vaccine done and uh, uh, get it out there in massive production. I'm, I'm a great fan of vaccines uh, throughout my career. I have uh, tried to, to kind of uh, uh, disseminate the message that vaccines are, are one of the greatest uh, contributions of science to, to humans, and uh, they're great success stories. We have several vaccines that are, that are wonderful success stories. This doesn't mean that necessarily we will have a success story with a vaccine for coronavirus. We have some experience uh, from the past, from efforts to develop vaccines for the other coronaviruses that we were aware, and they were not very successful. One concerning observation is that in some cases, vaccines were developed for animal models of coronaviruses because we have coronaviruses that infect cats and other animals, and uh, they caused more damage uh, than not giving them at all because uh, they led to a hypersensitivity response. So when the animal was exposed to the coronavirus, uh, it overreacted to, to the virus. And, and that actually could even lead to death and worse outcome compared to not having been vaccinated at all. We need to understand what is the exact mechanism that is leading to severe outcome in humans and, and death. And we need to understand whether it is the virus itself or the immune response to the virus that is doing more damage in different cases. If it's the virus and what the problem is that is that we don't get enough of an immune response, then we need to have a vaccine. If the problem is that it's the overreaction of our immune system that eventually leads uh, accidentally to destroying our own cells like lung cells, then a vaccine may actually be a bad idea. Bottom line, a vaccine needs to be very thoroughly vetted, very thoroughly tested. It, it, we need to have solid evidence that it works, solid evidence that it makes things better, solid evidence that it will save lives. And this cannot be done overnight. I, I, I wish that we could do it very fast, and I want to see these studies done, and I know that lots of brilliant scientists are, are working on this front, and I want to remain optimistic. But it's unlikely that we will be able to wait for 12 or 18 or 24 months to get a vaccine and even more so under such uncertainty. I don't think that we can remain in lockdown states uh, for so long and uh, not just destroy ourselves, destroy our communities, destroy our societies, uh, uh, create huge problems for health, uh, for unemployment uh, for our economy, for our society, that, that are much worse than uh, even the worst and most pessimistic scenario of what coronavirus can do. I want to get back to that, but uh, just very briefly, have you happened to run into a government study that showed that uh, people who had the flu shot were more susceptible to non-influenza pathogens? There are some uh, data that uh, are coming out uh, about uh, this issue. And I, I think we need to wait to have uh, some more mature uh, data set uh, across multiple countries and, uh, and try to understand what that means. Uh, we have seen that in some locations. For example, in, uh, in Italy, we saw that uh, in the three months preceding the uh, outbreak of COVID-19 with uh, these massive uh, uh, deaths being documented, these three months had been particularly good for the Italian population in terms of, uh, of deaths, in particular deaths from influenza and uh, related uh, 
uh, pathogens. In a way, though, that would mean that uh, uh, there was uh, a surplus of susceptible individuals that typically every winter would perish because of influenza. And these people didn't perish this winter, and that pool of susceptible individuals was then available for coronavirus to attack very fiercely and kill many of them. Is that evidence that uh, somehow there's some antagonism between influenza and coronavirus for occupying the same niche? I think that this is something that we need to look into, but, but it is a definite possibility that somehow the, these viruses are competing for the same pool of susceptible individuals. So if you save people from one of them, they may still succumb to the other. Um, just in terms of the general numbers right now in the United States, what is your sense of, uh, I think the CDC may have said they, there were 60,000 influenza deaths um, we are obviously well below that in terms of COVID deaths. Would we, as you earlier suggested, uh, if, if there weren't a certain amount of attention paid, would we have noted the addition of the corona fatalities to the normal flu season? Uh, what's your sense of the relationship between these two things? I think that uh, based on what we see now, clearly that would have been a detectable wave. Uh, it's, uh, it's a wave that in most uh, places around the world, including in uh, the United States, it's fairly acute. So we, we do see a, cl a clustering and an accumulation of uh, uh, both symptomatic disease and, and death. So, so it would have been detectable uh, as uh, uh, something that is beyond uh, what is the typical baseline for this particular month, for, for March and, and for, for April. In terms of uh, uh, how big uh, that wave is in terms of uh, total deaths, that's a, a bit early to uh, give a, an exact number, but clearly uh, I think we have avoided uh, all the apocalyptic scenarios that were circulated early on, about 40 and 50 million people dying around the globe and uh, two point five million people dying uh, in the U.S. Uh, as we speak now, we have uh, over 30,000 uh, deaths being recorded, but as we realize, these also include uh, these probable cases, and as we discussed, one needs to return and see at some point how many of those really were caused by COVID-19. So it, it is a serious problem. No one would uh, deny that. But it's clearly not the apocalyptic problem uh, that uh, we thought we would face early on. We have data now that uh, the infection fatality rate is much, much lower compared to our original expectations and fears. I think that there's no reason to fear. We have data. We have ongoing accumulation of data. We have eyes on the epidemic and its evolution. We can be... Uh, of, we, we should avoid panic and, and we can take rational steps to, to deal with the situation and, and hopefully even open up our society again with careful, gradual steps. Okay, I, I, I've got to ask, what do you think accounts for the huge discrepancy between the initial projections and what we're seeing now? I think in particular of the imperial study from Neil Ferguson, where 500,000 deaths were forecast in the UK right after the Oxford study came out that just that took issue with that he changed his forecast to 20,000 or under but said that this was due to one day's worth of there would have been one day's worth of social distancing he said this was due to the social distancing measures what what do you make of that claim and and what do you make in general of the huge variation between the initial forecasts and what we're actually seeing. The, the problem with uh, the Imperial College study and other similar studies that tried to forecast the number of deaths early on is that they used uh, uh, very inaccurate inputs in their modeling. Uh, the, you know, the scientists who did these calculations, they're, they're knowledgeable scientists, but uh, even the best scientists in the world, if, uh, if you give them uh, estimates uh, of parameters that are completely off, uh, in, in this case actually astronomically off compared to reality, they will get astronomically wrong results. And I, I think that this is what happened. And I'm not saying this to, to blame anyone. Uh, it, it's amazing that they could uh, 
put their work together so quickly, but uh, the input that led to their calculations uh, was completely wrong based on what we see now. In their subsequent efforts, they tried to uh, decrease uh, some of these estimates to more meaningful numbers, and uh, then the question becomes uh, uh, whether these massive decreases versus the uh, original estimates uh, are due to measures or due to correction of uh, some of these wrong uh, estimates that were used as input in the beginning. Clearly, wrong inputs is a very big component uh, because uh, they had to change, for example, the infection fatality rate that went into the calculations, and this immediately dramatically decreases the number of estimated deaths. How big is the contribution of social distancing measures? I think that this remains an open question and we need to accumulate the full picture of what happened in different countries before we can tell what exactly social distancing did for us and even more so, what different aspects of social distancing achieved. Uh, within the bag of social distancing, there's a, a very large number of different measures, like for example, school closures uh, or closing shops or avoiding mass gatherings. Uh, or uh, avoiding travel, or uh, avoiding people getting together, and if, if so, what is the uh, threshold of avoidance? Do you uh, set it at not allowing more than two people to get together, more than three people, more than 50 people, or, or what? Each one of these measures, uh, I think, could have different connotations and could have different effectiveness uh, in the field, I think that just saying that uh, measures worked is uh, is very, very poor statement. It, it's, uh, it's an overgeneralization, and I think that we need to scrutinize very carefully uh, which one of these measures worked, which ones did not work, and which actually may have done some harm. In principle, I think that we should not blame anyone for just acting ferociously and aggressively and saying shelter in place immediately, we just don't know what's going on. It, it, it was a very sound approach, but now we can be a bit more thorough, a bit more exact. Uh, for example, school closures. Uh, the evidence that we have suggests that maybe school closures decrease deaths by about one-fiftieth, like 2% uh, in relative terms, wh which is a very small number. Uh, again, this is preliminary knowledge and it needs to be vetted and uh, examined in more depth, but if really the benefit from school closure, especially kindergarten and uh, elementary school and uh, even middle school, uh, is so tiny and the consequences, the adverse consequences from closing schools are far bigger uh, in terms of many other consequences uh, that could also translate down the road to death equivalents. If, if you destroy society and the economy, you are likely to pay that in, in deaths uh, among citizens. And isn't there also a, a component to closing the schools that in terms of the virus could have been counterproductive? Isn't, isn't the concept behind group immunity getting a airborne respiratory virus to spread among those who have really no problem with it? so that therefore you've built that group Im immunity and you can shelter the vulnerable while the rest of us deal with the virus and it then has no more hosts to go through and you can dramatically decrease the, the amount of time that older people have to shelter. Uh, this is clearly a possibility and uh, we need to uh, see the, the full picture before we can uh, pass verdict on it, but Indeed, uh, it is possible that since uh, uh, little kids and, uh, and children in general don't really get severe disease, most of them are entirely asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, uh, they could contribute towards a pool of herd immunity without getting into trouble themselves. And if you could uh, protect uh, elderly and frail individuals from being exposed to kids, uh, uh, maybe you would have done a better compared to closing schools and asking kids to live in close quarters with uh, their grandparents and with uh, frail relatives and then infect them. It's also an issue of timing. Uh, for example, uh, different lockdown measures may have different benefits and different harms depending on what stage of the infectivity or the epidemic wave they're applied at. I think they may have different ability to, to limit 
the number of infections or, or actually increase the number of infections depending on whether they're applied in an early stage or a late stage. If uh, you go into lockdown in a situation where the inf virus is already widely circulating in the community and 30% of the people are actively infected and you tell them just go and stay at home with your relatives, with your grandparents, uh, with your, your relatives that have severe diseases, then you're forcing these people to just stay in close quarters day and night with uh, these vulnerable individuals. While this doesn't seem like a very good idea, uh, it varies also from one place to another. The, the ability to shelter in place is very different for, for me. I have a nice house and I have all the space I need. I can uh, uh, be far apart from my, my daughter if I wish to, but uh, in most places around the world, most people cannot really shelter in place effectively. Many of them have to go out to work because they work in essential uh, types of work that we all depend on. Uh, many others have no place to shelter at all. We have a very large population of homeless. They might go to a, a shelter, and we have seen recently data that suggests that this is the worst place to shelter because 35% of uh, homeless people in a shelter in Boston uh, tested positive for coronavirus. So in a way, we force them to, to be infected, which is completely horrible. We are, we are making things worse for them. Right? In, instead of trying to, to help people who are disadvantaged, we're making them even more disadvantaged and even more unequal with many of the measures that we're taking that are protecting some of us that are better off, but are leaving large segments of the population, both in this country and even more in other countries. And you can think of the third world completely unprotected. Now, but that, in the case of that homeless shelter, didn't, weren't most of those or all of them actually asymptomatic in the end? So far, none of them had symptoms. Uh, of course, we need to, to watch and see whether any of those might develop symptoms. But as you realize, uh, we know very well that uh, the chances of uh, developing symptoms uh, are much higher in people who are older and in people who have uh, underlying severe diseases. So young homeless people maybe are infected and they just don't realize that and they do well. But there's a lot of people out there who are homeless, who are disadvantaged, uh, who really have a rough time. And if we get to get them infected by what we do, that, that would be a disaster. I think that I really worry also that with many of the measures that we're taking, we might be creating armies of uh, unemployed people without health insurance. We may be creating more homeless people. We may be creating people who are disadvantaged. And in the setting of a pandemic, they will become easy victims while we are sitting in our nice houses. Doctor, I know you are diplomatic to a fault and very kind to your colleagues, but I, people have been asking me to ask you, how could very smart people at the WHO, Imperial College, et cetera, make a, a, such an excessive mistake? It just seems th this order of magnitude's mistake, is there any possibility that it's not just a dumb mistake? I mean, could, could they have really just been that truly, deeply, profoundly wrong with such horrible consequences? Uh, unfortunately, yes. And I think that uh, we should not see that as uh, evidence that science is failing or that even these scientists have failed. Uh, these scientists who created these models, they worked under extremely stressful conditions with extremely limited evidence. And when you have stressful conditions and uh, very limited evidence, the, the default option is to assume the worst and uh, try to protect people from the worst. So I, I think that this is what they did I don't think that uh, we should uh, uh, say that uh, they were bad scientists. They got it astronomically wrong. I think that that's indeed the case. But science got it right eventually, and it got it right pretty quickly, I would say, under the circumstances and under such a situation of panic and, and chaos. So I think that we should uh, remain cognizant of, of the power of science, of self-correcting itself, of getting things to uh, be correct eventually and hopefully pretty soon and really being the best thing that has happened to humankind. I think that science is the best thing that we have as humans to guide us. We just need better and more accurate science.
I'm a believer. I'm with you, doctor. But but here's the thing. Unfort you have been a corrective force and many other epidemiologists and doctors. But to this day, the Trump administration, and I won't make a distinction between the Trump administration and Fauci and Dr. Birx, they are su suggesting that, as is Neil Ferguson, that if we had not social distanced, we would, in fact, have seen two million deaths. Does your, in, in the United States, does your work suggest that the case fatality ratio with or without social distancing would mean that that was not the case? Does that what, does that what your serology study in California teaches us? Uh, both our serology study in California and uh, several other studies that have started uh, releasing uh, uh, some information uh, about uh, rates of infected people that are also very high in different locations around the world suggest that the infection fatality rate is very, very low. So uh, these scenarios of 40 million deaths in the world and uh, two plus million deaths in, in the U.S. Uh, by doing nothing are, are science fiction at the moment. I, I cannot describe them uh, in, in any other terms. Uh, this does not mean that social distancing did not have any benefit. I think we have to be very cautious and we have to revisit each one of the components of social distancing to see which of these components worked and perhaps which of these components actually created some harm. Uh, we just need to remain calm it's not time to blame each other. It's not time to say, I was right, uh, you were wrong. Uh, I'm sure that I make mistakes uh, day and night. Uh, I'm a scientist. I, I make mistakes, and I'm just trying to correct them. I'm just trying to get better data. And uh, next time we speak, if I have better data and these suggest that I was wrong in any of my statements, I'd be very happy to acknowledge that. We, we Just to be open, we need to be transparent. We need to trust science, and we need to move forward and reopen our world carefully, cautiously, but in a data-driven mode. Now, carefully and cautiously, does that mean necess of necessity contact tracing? Is contact tracing even a scientifically feasible idea in a city like New York where if I travel through Times Square or Grand Central Station, I am in contact with hundreds of thousands of people on a daily basis? and more if indeed this virus lives on surfaces for three days. So this, this, but this is the drumbeat that we will have to have this. Is this a scientifically feasible notion in the first place for an airborne respiratory infection? Contact tracing uh, makes sense in a situation where you have a very limited uh, spread of the virus and uh, you have very few people who have been infected. Uh, you, you know what is the index case, and you can track 10, 20, 30, 40 people who have been exposed and, and then identify those who are infected, quarantine everyone, and try to extinguish the epidemic. Uh, in, in some sense, uh, it has worked uh, fairly well in countries like Taiwan, uh, Singapore, South Korea, uh, where they were very aggressive in testing and identifying people who are infected and then trying to identify also their contacts. But it's not something that you can easily apply in the vast majority of uh, locations. And uh, clearly, it's not easy to do in a country like the U.S. You have to uh, realize that one f size does not fit all. And I have always been in favor of more testing because it gives us better insights into the epidemic. I have been in favor of random representative testing as well because it tells us with more accuracy what is the stage of uh, the current infection wave, how many people have been infected and or how many people are actively infected. But for locations where you have 10%, perhaps 20% of the population already infected, contact tracing, you can imagine almost uh, everyone in that location has been exposed. Uh, so New York City, for example, at the moment, we are in the process of launching a seroprevalence study, uh, hopefully very soon. If, say, we get uh, an infection rate of 30%, 30% uh, of New Yorkers haven't been infected, uh, it's very likely that almost every other New Yorker has also been exposed to them.
So you're contract saying, you're tracing. Saying, I'm sorry. Could you say that again? If if 30 percent of New Yorkers have been infected, this is uh, entirely speculative, as you understand. But uh, if 30 percent of New Yorkers have been infected, then the other 70 percent must have met almost all of them. Some of that 30 percent, you know, pretty recently. It, it, therefore, contact tracing means uh, just <laughs> just uh, the entire population in in that case. And uh, even with lower percentages, that 30% was entirely speculative. And please don't say that I came out and uh, was prescient <laughs> about anything. But even if you have uh, like 5% of the population being infected, uh, again, uh, one out of 20 people, each one of us is meeting lots of others in our daily life, even under conditions of shelter in place. I mean, many people have to work. Many people go out to shop. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to really track down everyone that that 5% uh, has exposed. Uh, please describe the strategy chosen by Sweden, and what is it telling us now? Sweden was one of the countries that uh, chose uh, a, a less restrictive approach. It uh, kept uh, much of its society and of its economy open. Uh, it allowed uh, most schools, uh, kindergarten and uh, elementary school and middle school to be open. Uh, it kept uh, uh, most shops open and bars and restaurants, although with some uh, modest restrictions. It also allowed people to uh, get together but not exceed uh, a limit of 50 people. So in, in a way, it is uh, very different compared to the draconian measures that were implemented with uh, very fierce uh, lockdown measures uh, in other countries in Europe and in, in many places uh, in the US. They have done fairly well. And uh, of course, it is very difficult to compare one country against another because uh, you expect to see large diversity in infection rates and uh, also in death rates. Uh, a country like Norway, for example, where the average uh, Norwegian is likely to see very peop few other people. Uh, you know, it's, it's very sparsely populated compared to Stockholm is not something that you can compare head to head. Uh, maybe you can compare Sweden uh, against uh, Switzerland, for example, that had uh, very draconian uh, measures uh, very early on. And uh, the death rate per million population is uh, slightly higher, a bit higher in Switzerland compared to, to Sweden until now. These are very, very tricky comparisons. These are comparisons that need to be made with great caution because they're observational data. You cannot create a, a Sweden in Switzerland. You cannot create a Switzerland in Sweden. So all of these claims that you will see circulating that uh, this is definitive proof that the lockdown worked, or even conversely, that uh, you didn't need that at all, I think that we have to be very cautious. No evidence so far, though, suggests that Sweden did something wrong. I, I think that uh, they seem to have fared pretty well. They had a number of deaths. The number of person years lost was pretty small because uh, almost all of these deaths were in people who were very frail and old and had very limited life expectancy. They never came close to seeing their health system crash. They always had plenty, plenty of reserves, at least until now. That might change in the future, and I'm, I'm watching that very carefully. But uh, I, I don't think that we can blame the Swedes for doing what they did. Maybe we should congratulate them. And what do you think of the German health minister suggesting that they open up nursery schools right away? I think that this is an interesting suggestion. And uh, both Germany and other countries in Europe, like uh, Denmark, uh, Austria, and even Italy, are taking steps at the moment as we speak to open up different segments of their society and of their economy. I think we need to see what happens. And I'm in favor of such steps if you have a situation where you have uh, peaked uh, infections uh, and uh, you start declining. If you have eyes on the epidemic, uh, you know that it's not out of control. If uh, you know that your health system still has a lot of capacity, that no matter what happened, you still have a lot of reserves uh, of beds and ICU beds. And all of these countries, Germany, Denmark, uh, Austria, uh, have plenty of reserves at the moment. Even Italy is taking steps in, in opening shops and, and some businesses. And in, in these areas that this is happening, they, they have the ability to track what happens and uh, uh, what 
might be the evolution of the epidemic as they do that. I want to remain optimistic, and I think that uh, more countries should take these steps if they have these uh, prerequisites in place and uh, see what happens. I, I, I don't think that we will be killing people. We need to do that and see what happens, because otherwise we will be killing massively people because of the lockdown measures. Uh, so speaking of the lockdown measures, was, and I'm just going to give you all three of these at once, and you can opine on them as, as best you can, and especially in light of Sweden, I'm very curious, was social distancing helpful in flattening the curve? Then was flattening the curve helpful for reducing stress on hospitals? And does flattening the curve ultimately result in fewer deaths or in just spreading them out? Do we inevitably have to follow the susceptible, infectious, resistant curve, uh, the epidemiological curve, no matter what, and all we're doing is, is pushing it downstream. That seems to be the suggestion. Uh, and so, and then I guess really, since we've never ever done this before, I guess you have to speak to the value of social distancing as best we can ascertain it now. But did, did the concept of flattening the curve actually help, first of all? So if, uh, if you look at uh, what the proponents of flattening the curve theory uh, have suggested, uh, which is a very interesting theory and may well be correct, is that you do that not to save lives, but to postpone uh, the epidemic wave in a sense, to flatten the curve and allow you to gain time so as to be, be better prepared. Uh, for example, get more beds in place, get more ventilators, uh, uh, prepare your hospital for that major battle to be fought, uh, prepare your testing capacity, get enough protective gear, you're buying time. But uh, eventually, sooner or later, once you uh, decide to remove uh, the shelter-in-place uh, situation, uh, you're back to a virus that needs to spread, and it will spread, and it will infect the people that it didn't infect immediately, but it will infect them later, and uh, you're just better prepared and with better capacity to deal with that. There is an excess of death uh, load if the healthcare system uh, crashes. Uh, I think that we have seen that because in, in that case, you cannot really offer care to people and some people who might have been saved if they had a ventilator available, they're dying because this is uh, not an option. However, with uh, much of that shelter in place, uh, uh, approach that we have followed, we have seen a collateral damage on health in that many people who have other serious conditions like heart attacks or strokes or, or things that they desperately need to go to the hospital, they don't go to the hospital because they have been in panic, they fear, they see all the news stories about uh, how horrible this thing is and they just don't want to go anywhere near the hospital. We know that for these common things that cause the large majority of deaths, modern medicine is effective. It can, it can save lives. And if these people stay at home because they're overdoing that shelter in place and overinterpreting it, we may be killing more people than any that uh, might be saved uh, by any measures for coronavirus. So w we have to be very careful. I think that it's very unfortunate that we had such astronomically wrong numbers early on. Unavoidably based on these numbers, we had to sound the alarm Unfortunately, people did panic, they did fear. Unfortunately, our hospitals now, in terms of the non-COVID-19 wards, most of them, many of them, are empty or, or completely underused uh, compared to what has been the typical utilization. And I, I think that this may be a huge problem. Now, you, your study, and I, this is the headline for me, your study, is, and I know you need to replicate this I know it needs to be peer reviewed. I know it's early days, but your study has essentially shown that this thing is as the case fatality rate is the same as seasonal flu. So shouldn't the major recommendation now be to open up as soon as possible, maybe keep sheltering the vulnerable, but should not should we not be uh, shouting from the rooftops that it is time to open up? I think that uh it is time to open up in many locations and the time is coming for others. I think that uh, if we are careful in collecting information on how the epidemic is evolving to make sure and to offer confidence and self-confidence to all people in our community, 
that uh, we haven't lost control of the epidemic because many people will still be very fearful. They will say, I don't want to go out. I don't want to do anything. People are still dying. Um, if we do that, if we offer science, if we offer reliable data, if we offer reassurance that this thing is not going to kill you, it doesn't seem to have a higher chance of killing you than uh, you know, seasonal flu for each person who is infected, although we know that there are some people who have a much higher risk, and these, of course, we need to protect very, very carefully. I think if we put that agenda in place, we could open up, and I think it needs to be gradual. It needs to be uh, reinvigorating uh, confidence in the population that uh, the right thing is being done, and it is to the benefit of our society and our citizens and all people, and then I think we will do well. We will have to watch it very closely, but if, if we don't do that, I don't really see an alternative. You said in your previous interview you're just a, a simple scientist, I, I, which I, and not political. And I just I, I want to uh, get you to reiterate this in some way. Is there because we see that the the battle over opening up or can remaining in place seems to be falling along partisan lines, not just in the United States, but all over the world, as if there is, you know, a, a, almost a battle either between left and right or between the bureaucracy at the CDC and the president or what have you. Is, are you above this fray? Are you, are you a Trump supporter or an anti-Trump supporter? Do you, is, 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 are you politically motivated in some way? Do you prefer the economics of the world over the lives of people, anything like that? I, I, I have to re reiterate that I'm just a simple scientist uh, who is just trying to correct uh, uh, one's own mistakes. I'm just trying to correct my mistakes and get it right and save lives. I have absolutely no political agenda uh, behind uh, my thinking and my calculations. Calculations in science are the same regardless of what political party one belongs to. They should be the same. And I, I think it is a major shame to uh, really uh, turn this into a political battle. There's lives at stake. There's lives of our fellow citizens. There's lives of people who are disadvantaged. There's lives of, of uh, our relatives. There's lives of, of, uh, of everyone. Uh, they're at stake. And I, I think that it's horrible to turn that into a political battle, either in this country or in any other country. We, we should remain united. We are homo sapiens sapiens. Humans, the wise, that's what we should be, you know, not just uh, partisan uh, uh, people who want to elect uh, one president or another or uh, promote the agenda of one political party. We are homo sapiens sapiens.